chapter 1. As you're turning there, it's always good to have our children back, but I will be honest. Uh, my oldest son, Wilson, and I often get in theological debates, and sometimes we agree on the essentials, uh, but there are some various things that we may disagree theologically, and sometimes our wives have to say, okay, go to the other corner, you know, but, uh, you know, um, it, it can be healthy to debate scripture. I know, I know one question that's often debated, who is the greatest person in the Bible other than Jesus? But who's the greatest person to walk the face of the earth? You know, some might say King David. He was a man after God's own heart. God himself declared that. Others might say, well, wait a minute. What about Moses? Moses was able to experience God in a time and in a way that no one else was able to experience. And he was the one, the vehicle through whom God gave his very law to the people. But then when you begin to say that, somebody say, now wait a minute, what about Daniel during the Babylonian captivity when everyone but he and his three friends sort of faltered, Daniel stood strong and was triumphant uh, in the Lord. The list could go on and on. Old Testament Joseph. Somebody would say, well, look at David. David uh, fell into temptation, but the Old Testament Joseph, when Potiphar's wife approached him, he was strong and resisted that. Some might say, what about the great ladies in the Bible? Ruth, who was so faithful and became part, uh, or Jesus was of her earthly line. Or what about Esther, who was most beautiful in her day, but used her beauty not to draw attention to herself, but to be a vehicle to bring forth the deliverance of God's people. Or Mary, the mother of Jesus, the list can go on and on. And granted, there are many things we can debate on the Bible. What's the greatest miracle? What's the greatest event? What's the greatest narrative? But to be honest, there actually is an answer to this question. And the reason we know it's an answer is what Jesus said in Matthew 11 and 11. He said, truly I tell you, among those born of women, not one was greater than John the Baptist. And he goes on to say, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven, who has been saved, who is in Christ, is greater than he. And so we might agree if Jesus said, John the Baptist, there's none greater, then we must at least admit that it's a tie. You know, there may be someone equally as great, but there's none greater uh, than he. When God chose to introduce himself publicly in his public ministry to this world, uh, the one who ushered that in was John the Baptist. He's such a figure of importance. Look with me at John chapter 1. I want to begin reading in verse 19. Again, uh, the apostle John wrote about John the Baptist who was distinct from him. In verse 19, this was John's testimony when the Jews from Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him, who are you? He did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. What then they asked him, are you Elijah? I am not, he said. Are you the prophet? No, he answered. Who are you then, they asked. We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What can you tell us about yourself? He said, I'm a voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, just as Isaiah the prophet said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees, so they asked him, why then do you baptize if you aren't the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet? I baptize with water, John answered them. Someone stands among you, but you don't know him. He is the one coming after me whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to untie. All this happened in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. Let's pray. Fathers, we open your word today and we look again at what is the truth, and it's this, that we have a story to tell. We thank you for the example of John the Baptist, considered great among all people by Jesus, feared by the religious leaders, amazed by the crowds, yet a humble servant pointing people to you. Lord, will we be like he is? And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. 
The context again for this is really at the inception of Jesus' uh, public ministry. Uh, John the Baptist has come to set the table for him. We know as we read in John chapter 2 verse 13 that this is just prior to the observance of the Passover. There was a great religious fervor among the Jews and the religious leaders were threatened by John the Baptist. John the Baptist was an enigma to them. He amazed the people. And basically, they sent a delegation of uh, Levites and religious leaders of that day to John the Baptist to inquire, really, who he was. And so it's at least one group, and some would argue that there were two different delegations that came and addressed John the Baptist. And very simply put, John was thrown into the fire. He was challenged. They were threatened by him. You know, when we walk with God, hopefully people will see a difference. And, and that difference will lead them to, we pray, have a lot of questions. In fact, in 1 Peter 4, 4, the apostle Peter said that people think it's strange that you, Christian, do not join with them in the same flood of unrestrained living that you used to live. Uh, I have a good friend I went to high school with, one of the roughest, toughest guys that I know. Now he's walking with God. Whenever I see him, there's a difference in him. And it's an encouragement, and it's a testament to the Lord. And that's what God desires from us, that we be a witness for the Lord, that people look at us, that they notice something different, and that leads them to ask questions. But as we'll see today, the questions are to always point to the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a story to tell. This morning, uh, very simply, I want to look at three things regarding John the Baptist. First, who he was not. Secondly, who he was. And finally, what he did. And we'll follow him in that order. First, John the Baptist, we want to see it, who he was not. Now, he was a lot of things. We just saw he was a man of great reputation. We see in our uh, text today that he was threatened by the religious leaders. Uh, they were uh, uncomfortable because of his popularity. We just saw in Matthew eleven eleven what Jesus had to say about him. But he was unique in his day. He stood head and shoulders above the crowd. Saul, when he was called to be king of Israel, stood ahead of above the crowd. When you looked out on the crowd, it would be like if I looked out today and somebody was that high. And so as, as we think about uh, John the Baptist, we don't look at him as one who physically stood head and shoulders above the crowd, but most certainly morally and spiritually, he stood out. He, he, but yet we see as popular as he was, as great as his standing was, it didn't inflate, inflate his own ego. He had a moral and a spiritual balance. So I want to look today at first what he was not. He was not the Messiah. He didn't deny it, verse 20, but he confessed, I am not the Messiah. The delegation thought that he might be one. At least they thought that he claimed to be one. But emphatically, he says, I myself am not the Messiah. He didn't just say, I'm not the Messiah. But when you look back in the, in the original language, he emphatically says, I, I most certainly am not the Messiah. The fervor was rampant. People were wanting to know about him. Could he be the promised deliverer? Was he the one? And he totally denied it. We've been talking about this story that we're to tell. In John the Baptist, it was so important for him that he keep that balance, that he understood what his ministry was, that he stayed in his lane, that he didn't go beyond the lines. And if we're to be effective witnesses, we need to understand the same thing is true for us. It can be so tempting to dress ourselves up, to make ourselves look important. But what we need is self-realization, that God is great and we're not. That we're not here to build up a church or a ministry or a person or a personality. That we're to build up the Lord Jesus Christ. It could have been so easy for John the Baptist to begin to enjoy all the adulation. It could have been easy for him to think, you know, 
uh, look at these people. I have them in the corner. They're really squirming here. They don't know who I am, but he kept his eyes on Jesus. But I want you to see a second truth. He was not Elijah. They asked him, well then, verse 21, are you Elijah? Again, he emphatically says, I am not Elijah. Now you can follow the reasoning of the religious leaders, the delegation at least that was sent. They were thinking, well, if he's not the Messiah, he must be the closest thing to the Messiah. And, and it was understood uh, by the Jews that Elijah would come before that great and glorious day of the Lord. In fact, Malachi spoke of it, the Old Testament prophet. In fact, uh, among Orthodox Jews, even today, who are waiting for the Messiah, we know that he has come and that he's coming again. Those that believe that they're still waiting for his first coming, when they observe the Passover feast, they leave one seat empty at the table. And that seat is symbolic of awaiting the arrival of Elijah. So as we look at it here, they said, are you Elijah? And he said, I'm not. Now Luke 1, 17 says that this one John the Baptist would come in the spirit of Elijah, and he did. But he was not literally Elijah. If you remember your Old Testament history, Elijah never died. He went up, and, and he went up into a chariot and never died. But John the Baptist was born of Zechariah and Elizabeth. He was not literally Elijah, but he came in the spirit of Elijah preparing people for the coming of Jesus. So then they moved on. They said, well, if you're not the Messiah or not Elijah, are you the prophet? Now, he was a prophet, but not the prophet in the way that they configurated it. It's so important as we go and share our story that we clearly share the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are many people who have in their mind who God is, what he's like, and what's acceptable to him. Yet we have God's word to guide us. And so as we tell this story, we need to understand that there may, may be many misconceptions about the Lord, but we're called to share the truth. But we're called to share the truth that he has given us, not as we see it. So we see John the Baptist first, who he was not, but look with me secondly at who he was. Who he was was closely related to what he did. For instance, literally, he's not John the Baptist, but he's known John, comma, the baptizer. In fact, uh, our, our oldest son, Wilson, is in a church in Suffolk, and they have a guy who leads in worship, a great man of God, loves the Lord, but he's a plumber. And so they just call him Luke the plumber. And so John was John the Baptist. He came to baptize. So after refuting the misperceptions about him, he, he describes who he is. And he goes back into Isaiah, and he said in verse 23, referring back to Isaiah, I'm a voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. As Lenski says, he's merely a voice with a message. He was a witness. He was not the Messiah. He was not uh, these individuals that the people had in their minds that he was to be, but he's saying, I'm a voice. Not the only voice. I'm a voice among many with a message. Now let's not be mistaken. In his time historically, John strategically was placed to do something he alone could do. But in our day, we live in our day. We're to be a voice in our time. When was the last time you shared about Christ with someone? You see, I, I'm, I'm a preacher, but I'm to be a preacher who witnesses. You may be a teacher, you may be a business person, but that's just part of what you do, but you're called to be a witness if you're a follower of Christ. And so he says, I'm a voice. I'm a voice in the wilderness crying out, make straight the way of the Lord. Well, let's look finally at what John the Baptist did. First, he did speak. He spoke of Jesus. He said, I am a voice. 
a voice actually communicates what you're thinking. Like right now, I may be thinking about what I'm gonna eat for lunch. You don't know unless I tell you, okay? Now, some of you may know, but you know me, but you know what I'm saying. But the voice articulates and communicates truth. Listen to these verses, three of them real quickly. 1 Peter 3.15, set apart Jesus as Lord, standing ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you the reason for the hope that's in you. If we're going to share the reason for the hope that's in us, we've got to use our voices. Romans 10, 14, how can they believe in one of whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without a preacher, without someone speaking to them? Romans 10, 8, just six verses before that, the message is near you. Where is it? It's in your heart. But before that, he said, it's in your mouth. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're to communicate the gospel of Christ. Now think about this, because I was thinking this week. If you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you heard the gospel, wouldn't it have been terrible 25 years before you were born that all messages, all verbal communication of the gospel had stopped? If it had stopped, you would not have heard. If you would not have heard, you would not have believed. Is it right for the gospel to stop with us? It's not. We're one month out from May 21st, and it's an outdoor service. And this church has a story to tell. And the desire of the outdoor service is not that we just get all together in our own little huddle and have our own little thing like we're a country club. No. The purpose of this is that we reach out and we invite friends, family, the community to hear the gospel of Christ. Hey, people are hungry. We are living in unparalleled days in our nation. Things are tough. It's tough out there, I'm telling you. And it's easy to become hardened to it and critical, and it's easy to be caught up. But the church has the answer. The answer is Jesus Christ. We must invite people. He spoke of Jesus. But I want you to see a second thing, and this really jumped out at me. He made it easier for others to believe. He said, I'm the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. He was a forerunner. Back in 1986, my, my junior year at Hamden, Sydney, um, we had a great dignitary come and offer the commencement address. I wondered why didn't we have the same the next year. But when I was a junior, the senior class had George Herbert Walker Bush come and bring the address right here in Farmville. At that time, he was vice president of the United States. And the LD probably can remember that. The couple of weeks leading up to it, we saw guys that weren't looking like Hampton, Sydney guys around. They were maneuvering around. They were preparing for the vice president to come. There were secret service agents and they were around the periphery. They were scoping the scene. Why were they coming? They wanted to make sure that there were no negative events and they wanted to make his arrival easy so that people could hear from him. That's what John the Baptist was doing for Jesus. He was making it easier for people to believe in Jesus Christ. I wonder today, is that how you look at my life? God, I want to make it easier for someone to believe in you. I want my life to make it easier for someone to believe in you. I want my words to be so clear that someone can believe. He made the path clear. He made it easier for others to believe. Third, he came bringing a baptism of repentance. Hey, they were asking him, verses 24 and 25, you know, hey, why are you baptizing? You, you just told us you're not Elijah, you're not the prophet, you're not the Messiah, why are you baptizing? And John says, I baptize with water, but again, there's one coming out after me that's greater, and we know that he came preaching a baptism of belief in Christ, belief in himself, and inner cleansing. Now John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. 
We know that because in Acts chapter 19, when Paul, we studied Ephesians a, a, a few weeks ago, when he came to the, the people at Ephesus, there were 12 individuals who had received John's baptism, but they said, we'd never heard of Jesus. And he didn't say, well, that's fine. He said, let me tell you about Jesus. He shared Jesus, and they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what do we learn from that? that John, while his ministry was essential, it wasn't enough. That's why he said, there's one coming after me who's greater. But it was essential. It's like a softball coach like Mark. You got to get to first base before you get to second base. And so repentance was first base. They needed the message of repentance so that they might from there move forward to belief in Jesus Christ. Repentance is essential to salvation. You can't get to second until you get to first. Years ago, we took a group of youth in the community, and we were sharing Christ. We took them into Farmville. I remember talking to a young guy. He was probably 16 or 17, and I was speaking with a couple of youth. We were talking to him, and we said, you know, we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He said, I've never sinned, and I spent about... 10 seconds trying to convince him. I wish I had known some of the tools that John Parker has because there's some great tools for that. But at that time, that was about 20 years ago, we realized, hey, if this guy doesn't realize that he's a sinner, he's not going to see the need for a savior. John came to make it easier for people to realize we're sinners so that they were easily, more easily able to receive Jesus Christ. And so he came preaching a baptism of repentance. And then finally, we see that wasn't enough. He deferred to Jesus. He said, there's one coming after me who's greater than I am, so great I'm not even worthy to be his servant. John's ministry was integral, but it wasn't enough. Repent, he said, but believe in the one who's coming after me. That's the message of the gospel. I wonder today, have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? When we take his message, church, it's not about the church or about the preacher, or about any individual. It's about Jesus. So as we close today, there's really a twofold application. If you've never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, why not? Why have you not entrusted your life to him? If you've never been baptized, why have you never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and then be willing, be willing to publicly profess him in baptism? Does baptism save a person? No, it doesn't. Baptism is an outward symbol, much as my wedding ring is in regard to the marriage. But it's a way that we publicly profess our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In this side of Calvary, we have a baptism of repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Would you do that today? Maybe you've already done that. Are you a voice for Jesus? Are you making it easier for those in your circles to believe in him? Do you really desire to see people come to know the Lord Jesus Christ? Or if it would be honest, you would say, well, God, I want to, but not enough really to be obeying you. I don't know how God's leading you today. I want to give you in a moment an opportunity to respond. I want to pray and we're going to sing. And as everyone stands and sings, if there's a decision you need to make here at the front, I'll be at the front if you want to come and pray at the altar, however God leads. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for the example of John the baptizer. We thank you, Lord, that he came in obedience to you. But Lord, we don't worship John. Lord, he wasn't even worthy by his own admission to Loosen your sandal strap. But Lord, he pointed people to you. Lord, you're the answer. Lord, it's not in religion. It's not in politics. It's not in education. It is an internal washing through the blood of Christ when we believe 
that, Lord, you turn us around from the inside out. If there be any here today who need to take that step of obedience, saying, I want to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, stir their hearts today. For those of us who have already trusted in Christ, you've given us a commission. Lord, we're called to take the gospel. We're called to be a voice in our time. And Lord, we are also called to do everything within your power working through us to make it easier for people to believe on you through our lifestyle, through our witness, through our words. Father, move in this hour, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a God.